so what I would like you to do is imagine a world in which all healthcare systems speak the same language with the same meanings covering all of healthcare. Now that is obviously not what we have today. Is it a possibility? What would it look like? What would it be like if we had that? Well, it would facilitate a lot better treatment, a lot better research, and a lot lower cost if we had that. Because there's a lot of friction involved in our current situation. It means that we'd have true semantic interoperability between healthcare records. Uh, and when they're exchanged and combined, they would be meaningfully exchanged and combined. So will RDF get us there? No, it won't. Uh, as uh, others have mentioned, um, uh, RDF by itself can't do that. Uh, but it can get us closer, and along with the right policy um, uh, incentives in place, it can get us a lot closer. So what I'm going to try to do now is explain a bit why uh, RDF is good for this kind of thing. The first thing, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Charlie, is that there's an emphasis on semantics that, uh, rather than syntax in RDF. RDF is syntax independent, and given suitable mappings, uh, existing formats can actually be viewed or thought of as RDF. As long as you have a mapping from that format to the RDF model, you can think of that format as actually intrinsically being RDF, right? The information in there can be exposed as RDF that way. So that's one of the key reasons. A second key reason is that um, RDF information can be self-describing. It doesn't have to be, but it can be, and it has a very good uh, way to be self-describing. All concepts in RDF are, described, are uh, identified by URIs, and those URIs can be dereferenceable to definitions. And that can be very helpful in bootstrapping new vocabularies, very important. So that even if you don't know a particular vocabulary, if you receive some RDF that, that uses that vocabulary, if you just dereference the URI for a concept in that vocabulary and you get back a definition, that helps a lot in bootstrapping. A third key reason is that RDF is schema promiscuous. I've kind of struggled with figuring out how to describe this. And this is my latest way of describing it. Um, multiple data models can peacefully coexist in RDF. And this is not true in the world of XML, for example, uh, a schema-centric language like XML. Um, when multiple models coexist in RDF, they can be semantically linked as well. So they can be really meaningful, all in the same data. And I'm going to show you a little example of that, of what I mean by that. So let's suppose you have an application that has some data model. It's the, it's the blue application that has this blue data model. Okay? In this case, it's for like a name and address kind of thing for a customer, blue customer. And then there's some other application, the red application, that was independently developed uh, that has uh, another model for customers or, or patients or whatever it is. And again, it's got uh, addresses, names and addresses, things like that. And now you want to use these together. Okay? So in the world of RDF, if you just merge the RDF data, when nodes uh, are in common, when they were using the same concepts identified by the same URIs, they just join automatically. Now, that won't always happen, but uh, when that does happen, you get a lot for free there. So these models now can be uh, uh, used together in the same data and coexist. Now, um, not everything is going to join automatically like that. Uh, sometimes, or often actually, you will have similar concepts that are identified using different URIs, and you need to explicitly say what the relationships are between them. But again, those relationships can be explicitly represented in RDF itself as well. So now we have the relationships being captured that what was called town over in the red model was simply called city in the blue model, so it's really the same. And what was a, a zip code in the red model that, uh, with the extra four digits, so it's a nine-digit zip code, uh, in the blue model, there's just a zip code, and it's a five-digit zip code, so it's really a refinement of the blue uh, zip code. 
And a full name has both a first name and a last name, so define those relationships as, as well. Okay, and on top of that, now, uh, another model can be defined that draws from pieces of the red model and the blue model, I'm calling it the green model here. Okay, and again, is, is linked in with these. And all of these things can coexist in uh, the RDF instance data. So, what does, uh, I'm missing something there. So, what does the, uh, what does the red model see? Excuse me, what does the red application see when the red application looks at all this data? It sees the exact same thing. There's no change as far as the red application is, is concerned. Okay? It has a view of the world, which is kind of this red view of the world, and that's what it sees. It doesn't care about the rest of the links that are in there. It doesn't care about the rest of the, uh, the, the blue model and the, and the green model that are in there as well. Okay, and I'm missing a diagram here. I don't know why it didn't render. But the same thing is true then for the green model and the, the blue model. Each one, excuse me, the green application and the blue application. Each one kind of sees its own view of the same data. Okay. All right, so then the fourth reason, the fourth major reason I would say for why RDF is good for this is that it is a, uh, a neutral, mature international standard. So um, you don't have uh, big parties that have a large vested interest uh, in uh, keeping others out, for example. Okay, so in short, um, even though it's not the only way that one might imagine uh, trying to achieve uh, interoperability, it is the best available option that we have on hand. Okay, so what do we mean then at, when we talk about RDF as a universal healthcare exchange language? Uh, does this mean that we have to change all of our electronic health record databases to be RDF stores? No, it doesn't mean that. Uh, it means we leave them in place and we just transform to and from RDF during exchange. Okay. Does it mean we have to discard all of our existing standards for uh, healthcare information representation like HL7, SNOMED, etc., all of these things? No, we don't have to discard those. It means we leverage them by mapping them to RDF. So basically, one of the first principles is it means that we use RDF as a substrate for exchanging uh, the healthcare information. And this means either exchanging data directly in RDF, in other words, directly in a, an accepted uh, common <coughs> RDF syntax, okay, or exchanging data in a standardized format, a common standardized format, that can be mapped to the RDF model, okay? In other words, if there's already a mapping defined from that syntax to RDF, then that's just as good. Second thing, it means adopting standard syntactic mappings of these common formats, these common idiosyncratic formats that are already established into the RDF model. And this is facilitated by the fact that RDF is syntax independent. As long as you have a, a, a mapping from that syntax or that format into the RDF model, that's what's important. Okay? Some of these mappings have already been created and uh, Eric is going to talk a little bit about, about a couple of them, I think, later. So that's the second point. Third point is it means adopting um, standard URIs for things, uh, for healthcare concepts. So we have thousands of concepts involved in healthcare. It means uh, assigning a standard URI for each of these. And this has already been done all for <coughs> some of the vocabularies, although they haven't been um, sort of officially standardized uh, necessarily. Um, and ideally, uh, each of these URIs should be dereferenceable to a free and open definition for that term. And again, to make the information be self-describing. It's also important to as assign uh, standard URIs for things like, well, for people, places, and institutions. Uh, doctors, for example, hospital institutions, things like that. 
Now, when I talk about making these uh, dereferenceable to free and open definitions, I'm only talking about the definitions being uh, freely available. I'm not talking about making people's healthcare information itself uh, publicly available. Okay, just the definitions. So that's the third principle. The fourth principle is to adopt standard semantic mappings. Okay, after you've gotten out of the syntactic world. So, Standard semantic mappings between overlapping concepts. So if there are multiple vocabularies being used, for example, um, or if there are multiple terms within a vocabulary that have overlapping meaning, <coughs> then uh, define standard mappings between those. So for example, uh, if there's a concept for, uh, let's see, for systolic blood pressure, and there's also a concept of uh, systolic blood pressure taken while sitting, while the, the, while the patient is sitting, okay? That one, uh, the systolic blood pressure while the patient is sitting is a, kind of a finer granularity than the just systolic blood pressure. So the systolic blood pressure subsumes the other one. So that relationship can be defined uh, in RDF. And these kinds of relationships or standard semantic mappings should be provided and adopted. A fifth principle, which uh, is beyond the scope of this workshop, but is also very helpful, is to make use of linked data principles, uh, RESTful linked data principles. That kind of helps grease the exchange of information uh, as well. So those are the main principles behind the use of RDF as a universal healthcare exchange language. So how do we achieve adoption um, of RDF as, as a universal healthcare exchange language. Well, the bad news is that there's a lot of um, vested uh, interest in keeping things the way they are. Um, and the, the fundamental problem is that there is no financial incentive for the creators and providers of healthcare information to make it interoperable with others, right? Um, if a, if uh, hospital A requests a, a health record, healthcare record from hospital B, there's no incentive for hospital B to make it interoperable with hospital A. Okay, no financial incentive, I should say. Maybe they have goodwill and wish to do it for that reason, but there's no financial incentive. And that's a big problem because healthcare is is a business in this country. So that's the bad news, but the good news is that government agencies can uh, mandate or provide incentives to help uh, encourage this along. Uh, and that has started somewhat, not specifically with RDF as a universal healthcare exchange language, but the idea of so-called meaningful use uh, in healthcare. Uh, there are incentives for that. So it's essential that government agencies uh, incentivize healthcare data interoperability. So what do I mean by semantic interoperability? Well, let's suppose you have um, a receiver here and two senders of information. So the receiver has requested certain healthcare information that they're off they've been authorized to get. And uh, they, the receiver wants to combine that information from sender one and sender two and, and do a query uh, on that information. So um, what needs to happen? Well, the original information here might be in completely different formats and represented in totally different ways. So I've got it illustrated here as uh, sender one is represented in some form of HL7 versus, uh, uh, version two, and sender two is represented in, uh, in, uh, in a FHIR, F -H -I -R, which I forget what it stands for, but um, Eric, what does it stand for, FHIR? Fast is fast H, I think it's all fast. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So how do we achieve this? Okay, the receiver then wants to do some, some kind of query. The receiver wants to do some kind of query, such as a Sparkle query. Okay, so how do we achieve this semantic interoperability? Well, let's take a look at what the sender's information looks like. Okay. So here's what it might look like. Now this is a totally fictitious example. I've made up the codes and stuff but, and made it shorter, but it looks kind of like this, okay? So this is what uh, kind of like what HL7 version two looks like, these, these sort of messages. Okay, and then 
Uh, Sender 2 is using something else here, which is a, an XML-based format, and it looks kind of like this. Okay, and it's using totally different codes also. All right. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's look also at the at the uh, the receiver's query and see what that looks like. Okay, if you if you're familiar with Sparkle queries, that's what this is, is Sparkle query, but it doesn't look anything like what the, the original data looks like, right? It's not using the same uh, terms at all. So how is this going to work? Well, let's see what we have to do. So first of all, the first step is uh, a syntactic transformation is needed to go from whatever the original source syntax was um, into a substrate model. And this is the, the idea of using RDF as a substrate model. Okay, it's a representation language that can hold lots of different models in it. Okay, that will allow the data to be merged together once that is transformed into that RDF substrate model. The data can then be merged, but the data may not link semantically because it was not represented using the same vocabularies or things like that. In other words, it can syntactically join at this point after it's converted into RDF, but it will not be necessarily semantically joined. It might be somewhat, but it may not be also. So let's see what we need to do for that <coughs> syntactic transformation. Here is the first transformation that needs to happen. So sender one is going to have to transform from this HL7 format into RDF. And this is a pretty straightforward uh, transformation that um, it's, it's kind of like a direct mapping from whatever that format was into uh, sort of the, the most obvious form of RDF that you would produce for it. Okay? And similarly, sender two. Let's look at that syntactic transformation. Again, it needs to go, in this case, from uh, XML and be transformed into RDF. And again, here it's transformed into kind of the most obvious form of RDF coming from that. Okay? And I don't know if you noticed, but again, the terms that are being used in this RDF did not match the terms that were used in this one here. Okay? So they're semantically not matching up yet even though they are now in this common RDF uh, substrate. Okay, so now what do we need to do for the next step? Semantic transformation. We need to do a semantic transformation to get the semantics, uh, the, to get the models to line up. So we can do that with something like a, uh, a Sparkle uh, construct rule. There are lots of ways this can be done, but this is one of the convenient ways is to use a, a Sparkle rule. So here's a rule that will convert from the, the uh, sender one's RDF into a, another model in RDF that now can be joined together. Okay, now we'll be using common terms. And now let's take a look at the semantic transformation that happens for sender two's RDF. So here's another Sparkle uh, construct rule that does it for sender 2's RDF. So notice that what's being um, converted here, all these terms are being converted into some output model. I've called it M out here. Okay. Now this uh, RDF data that's merged together will semantically link. So let's see what it looks like now. So here is the merged RDF now, and now you'll notice that, the, that it is using the same kinds of terms. We see um, BP systolic there, and we see BP systolic here. They're both um, observations according to this output model, M out, and there are the values for them. And this one you'll see has a position. It indicates the position in which the, the uh, blood pressure reading was taken. This one does not have that information because it was not in the, the observation that it came from. But nonetheless, the, the data is now semantically joined up, okay? And that Sparkle query that the receiver wanted to do over it now works, okay? And we'll now pull up results from both of them. So that is the, that's the basic idea. But 
A key point here is that in order for this to happen, these semantic mappings need to be standardized. Okay, so there needs to be um, standards produced for those mappings to go from, well, actually there's two mappings. There's the syntactic mapping, right, from the, the original uh, source format, and then the semantic mapping, semantic transformation. So it's important to standardize those. Now, a question that will come up if you've been paying attention is, okay, that mapping was done, but what, I'm backing up here just a second, what was that target vocabulary, this ML? What model was that? What vocabulary was that? What should it be? So what vocabulary should be used, okay? Well, this brings up the question of how do you get from one vocabulary to another vocabulary, or from one data model to another data model, okay? Now, the most efficient way to do it is to use standards and have um, <coughs> hub and spoke kind of transformations. In other words, if you had one big standard, right, that had all of the terms in healthcare that we needed, all of the concepts, then it could be very efficient because all you have to do is map to and from that. So regardless of what you started out with in your existing system, you could go to that standard and then from that standard, the, the recipient could go from that standard to whatever their system is using. So this is um, the most efficient and it is always desirable when it is possible. Always desirable when it's possible. The problem is that the larger the standard gets, the more terms, the larger the committee, the less feasible it is and the longer it takes to get there. So, in reality, what we need to do is we need to accommodate not just standards like that, but also diversity. And this is a key aspect of RDF that makes RDF work like this, is that RDF accommodates both standards and diversity. So, you don't have to have just one standard, okay? It's good if you can have only one standard, but the fact is you're gonna to have to have more than one. But RDF accommodates that. So in transforming from one uh, to another, from one model to another, for example, from one sender to a receiver, the transformation does not have to go necessarily through just a single standard. It can actually go through multiple standards or different pieces of it can go through different standards. And some of the things, some of the vocabularies and data models that it goes through are not, don't even necessarily have to be standards. Okay, now this also brings up the uh, issue of um, how do standards get adopted? Um, you know, there's, there's lots of parties that exchange uh, electronic health information and hundreds of different requirements. Each party will have its own specialized requirements. And these range from broad categories from like clinical care to research to billing, but you know, there are lots of specialty areas as well. And then there's the fact that new standards get developed over time. So, um, the reality is that when a standard comes out, you do not have a situation where everybody suddenly adopts it all at once on the same day, okay? What happens is you have different parties adopting different standards at different rates. Okay, plus there's the fact that not all healthcare concepts have standard uh, URIs that identify them. Okay, so the standardized concepts are really just a, a subset of all healthcare concepts. <clears throat> and as we standardize more, then we cover more of those healthcare concepts, right, over time. But then also the world keeps growing, right? Science keeps moving ahead, medicine keeps going ahead, right? So there's also more healthcare concepts all the time. Okay, so there's a continual need to be developing new standards. Okay, it's not just a one-time thing or a static thing. It's, a, it's an evolving situation where standards need to be continually adopted to continually 
cover more and more concepts that are needed in healthcare. Okay, so RDF um, accommodates this by the way it is uh, schema promiscuous. Um, I should mention that um, a, a bit about semantic uh, fidelity and granularity. Um, different models or different vocabularies uh, have different granularity for concepts. And when I say granularity, I'm talking about how much detail is included, right? How fine is the detail? Uh, so for example, a blood pressure measurement uh, that, that specifies that it was taken when sitting and it was taken in the patient's left arm uh, is, has finer granularity than one that just says that it was a blood pressure measurement of uh, 120 over 70. Okay? So that's what I mean by granularity. Um, and for fidelity, I'm talking about um, avoiding any loss of information. Uh, for example, uh, there are lots of different definitions of what it means for somebody to be a smoker. Right? Some definitions would say something like, you know, have they smoked more than this number of cigarettes you know, during the past six months? And others would say something else. Right? So if you are uh, trying to combine data that, that was recorded according to different definitions, then you've got to watch out for that semantic fidelity so that you don't uh, lose information in converting from one concept or one term to another. So a critical element here is that when data is transmitted, it's important to retain the full semantic fidelity and granularity, okay? including for data that has not yet been standardized. Okay? Now remember, I pointed out that not everything is standardized. right? So even for the data that's not standardized, it's important to retain the full semantic fidelity. Why is that? Why, why, but why even bother to send data that's not standardized? I mean, who could understand it anyway? Well, the point is that some recipients will be able to make use of it. And in fact, it will give them a competitive advantage to make use of that additional information that has not yet been standardized. And it also helps bootstrap the standardization process so that even though those terms, for example, uh, that are included in there have not yet been standardized, at some point, hopefully, they will become standardized. So it helps bootstrap that, problem, that process, and it avoids this dilemma where um, you know, nobody produces the products because there's no consumers to consume them, and there aren't any consumers to consume them because there's no producers producing them. So, it's important that the data providers provide all of the requested data, not only the standardized portions, okay, but all requested data, and the data has to be self-describing so that those portions that are not standardized can be figured out and understood by those recipients or parties that, that you know, are going to go to that extra trouble okay, and bootstrap the whole process. So, those are the basic principles behind uh, RDF as a universal healthcare exchange language. These four principles plus the use of uh, RESTful linked data principles, which we won't cover today. That's it for this, my part here. Do I have questions?